I thank you, Lord Jesus, because uh, you care about us and you desire to always take our burdens from us. Now teach us and speak your word to us, even as we reflect on Christian unity. May you use me to the glory and praise of your holy name. This is our humble prayer, trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And I greet us all in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus. Good afternoon. Yes, it is a great pleasure for me and privilege uh, to share the word this afternoon. Thank you very much, Provost and the leadership of this church for the opportunity. Today, we principally wind out the book of Romans. Our primary text, which runs to verse 13 of chapter 15, closes Paul's application of the scriptures to the Roman believers. Verse 14 to the end of chapter 15 is basically his epilogue, and the final chapter of Romans is his greetings to those he esteems in the ministry. I have no doubt that indeed you have offered yourself as a living sacrifice to God, renewed in mind and been transformed so far into pleasing God through knowing and understanding of his will. Last week, that practical living challenged believers to accommodate each other without passing judgment on matters disputable. Now that thought of thinking about others winds out chapter 15 today with Paul pushing for unity among believers, primarily addressing the stronger believer. I know from last week you saw the argument of the weak and strong believer and what they both stood for. So in our passage, Paul is pushing for unity between the strong and weak believer. That is the summary statement I would give this passage as we look at it. But as we look at this strong weak interaction, we shall see that God desires believers to be united and reveal his love to the world. I have divided the passage in two sections, each beginning with the letter E for easier reference and memory. Example and enabler. So in part one, verse one to six, we shall have unity example. And part two, verse seven to 13, we shall have unity enabler. And like I said earlier, the main truth for you and I to take home is that God desires believers to be united and reveal his love to the world. Thank you so much, media team, for preaching together with me. It is right there on your screens. So let us begin with verse 1 and 2 of part 1. Paul gives the directive. The stronger believer must bear with the failings of the weaker one. The stronger is neither the better nor the weaker the worse. They are equal. It is just the way they see things. And last week we were told about the scruples between the weak and the stronger believer. So we carry along that perspective here. So Paul is addressing the stronger believer to bear with the failings of the weaker one. And I hope you realize, though, this has nothing to do with sin. Paul is not suggesting the stronger believer puts up with the sin of the weaker believer, but rather in their failings, especially from disputable matters. The concept of sin is taken care of in a different passage. 
The be stronger believer should not be selfish. Don't look down on the weaker one and disregard them. Offer and be willing to be a support base for them. Do not rule them out of the fellowship. Rather, bear with them. Who knows? Through you, they may just fulfill their potential. So bear with them. Be united together with them. Don't build any schism in between you two. That is what Paul is pushing. And we should please our neighbor for their good to build them up, not for our own selfish gain. That means we should not be a people pleaser, seeking to please people for our own selfish ends, but to pursue to do what is right. Please them for the sake of building them up, steer them from evil, build them in the word, be united with them so that you may mature them in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is essentially what Paul is saying. And verse 3, he gives us the reason why. For Christ did not please himself. He is the reason for us to receive and suffer those who are weaker. Jesus came to serve others, dedicating his life to the purpose and plan of the Father. So Paul is challenging the Romans that they too ought to follow after the selfless example of Jesus in supporting the weaker brethren. Jesus did not think of himself to do what pleased him, but for the sake of others, gave out his life freely. The just for the unjust, the righteous for the unrighteous, the deserving for the undeserving. Do you only unite with those you consider deserving? We are being called to mutual unity in the body of Christ. And thanks be to God, we have just received 126. Was your heart stirred? That amen, God is adding to our fellowship. Or were you just like, yeah, right. Let it just be. And guess what? The church itself was birthed with 120. And the fire of the gospel transformed this whole world to billions today. I believe these 126 are equal and adequate to the task of flowing with the gospel to the whole world. And I welcome them to join different ministries in this cathedral and continue to spar and fan the flame of Christ. But together with them and us, we are one. God is saying, see them as you see them yourselves. Receive them as you are. Jesus is our example for selfless living. He suffered beyond what we can endure or imagine. Even though many in his day witnessed what he went through. Today we suffer for his glory, but in a very insignificant manner. Sharing in his suffering as it were. Though never measuring up to what he underwent for us. But why so? He allows it upon us to build our strength and give us endurance to persevere and hope within the circumstances that we go through. So the scriptures of old, Paul says, were given for teaching and guidance through life, that in reading and living them out, they would secure believers in the circumstances they were in, but primarily that they would have hope. Now today we have the whole council of scripture with the writings of the Old and New Testament. So in the same way, the word of God 
gives us strength and patience to endure what we experience on an everyday life experience. And here I doubt whether Paul was talking about hope of just eternal life. Why? Remember these were believers already. They were certain about the promises of Jesus to whoever believed in him. We do not hope for eternal life. As believers, eternal life begins or began when we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that doesn't come as a shock to some of us. You are an, you are an eternal being. Just waiting for the Lord to come. And if he comes while you're still alive, your body will just be transformed. But for those who sleep, they will be raised and put on immortality. And together with us, we will meet the Lord in the air. So through his word, he grants us strength to endure present challenges and circumstances. So that is where our hope is renewed to overcome. Verse 5 and 6, Paul's prayer for unity for the believers at Rome. Paul prayed that these believers were to develop a spirit of unity among each other as they followed the example of Jesus. To what end? So that with one heart and mouth, they may bring glory to God. So our unity is not of belief in the heart, but it must also be confessed in testimony of the spoken word. This would fully unite us, one with another. And I'm wondering, when was the last time anyone had of your testimony of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ? Our unity should have as its end, its chief end, the glory of God. That should be the purpose of us receiving and walking with another. And this unity is so personal to Jesus that he prays to the Father for it to happen. That was our New Testament reading from John chapter 17. Now the Gospel of John is the only one with the direct purpose of writing. John said and he declares that these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing you may have life through his name. That is the reason the Apostle John wrote the gospel. And in this very portion coming from the private discussion of Jesus alone with his 11 disciples, preparing them for what was ahead of them just after the Passover. So the son prays to the father. John unveils an intimacy between the father and the son that we cannot begin to fathom. But look at how you and I were in Jesus' prayer. He says, my prayer is not only for them alone, the disciples, but for those who will believe in me through the message of the disciples who were the apostles. The message of the gospel that the apostles preached and passed on to us, even today, who have received it. And for what end? That all of them may be one, Father, as you are in me and I am in you. How amazing. That is the unity Jesus desires for us to experience and enjoy. The same one he shares and enjoys with the Father to have unity of purpose. And this is the whole plan of redemption, reconciling us to God and to one another. The whole Bible story fits together in this prayer of Jesus, that they may be one, just as he is one with the Father. Might you be a stumbling block 
to the prayer of Jesus from fulfillment by rejecting your fellow believer. Jesus prayed we ought to be one. Back to Romans. We are called for unity for the glory of God. Are there any benefits to our unity? Plentiful, I'd say. Shackles of bondage fall away. Just for example, remember Paul and Silas in prison? Shackled and bound, but their spirit and mind was free. They were united in worshiping and praising God. I'm sure after they continued in prayer and the word, they were led to sing a song of worship and praise. And what happened? Literally, the chains fell off. The prison doors opened on their own accord because the power of God attended to that united pair. And I'm wondering, what spiritual doors or chains might our unity, you and I, and you and your brethren, open for us today. As a Kenyan, I'm not ignorant of the clamor of many voices against perceived oppression. What can unity achieve? Especially from Christians. We need to be the bar that sets the standard for the world to watch and learn and come to the Father. You can see how the world is struggling with unity. But we are called to reveal and show the unity of God. Well, we can endure the current challenges or the current circumstances because of hope, because we know nothing lasts forever. Even this will come to pass. But guess what? We can also focus on where the real change can come. Something we always rise up to go and cast. Imagine we are 10,000 strong here in the cathedral. If each person prays and asks Jesus, just give me 10 like-minded people to believe what I believe and to join me in this quest would be a hundred thousand strong. Can a hundred thousand votes give you an MCA you desire? Can a hundred thousand votes give you an MP you desire? Are you doing the math? Can a hundred thousand votes give you a senator? A governor can a hundred thousand votes give you the leader you desire to the glory of God united I believe you can but that remains the question can you be united as one so when we think of others before ourselves and focus on glorifying our Lord Jesus we shall make strides to mutual unity. And this brings me to our first lesson this morning, or afternoon, if you will. Jesus is the perfect example for believers to pursue unity. Jesus is the perfect example for believers to pursue unity. I hear there's what they call shadow coaching. Where if it is a position one was looking for, you would be hooked or enjoined to the person doing that work. And you'd follow him or her closely to understand what they do or the job that you're looking for. And after that, a certain period of time, you'll be naturally inducted to do that work. So I wonder whether you have steadfastly followed and studied Jesus to freely know what to do with your brethren concerning unity. 
Have you known enough of Jesus to know how to relate with another? Is there a reason you struggle to unite with others because you have not known the love of Jesus? And how may his example then spar and challenge you to faith this afternoon for the glory of his name? That is Jesus, our example to unity. Let us step into the second part, our unity enabler. Verse 7 to 13. Now verse 7 and 13 tuck away verse 8 to 12. They open and close that portion of scripture. And verse 7 itself seems to reiterate what Paul is expressing on unity, but has a slight turn of conclusion. What does he say? Accept one another then as Christ has accepted you. So not only do we follow the example of Christ, but it is the very reason for doing so. That is what Paul is saying. Because we have been the recipients of his same acceptance. That's the same degree he accepted us. When we were nothing, we were wretched. So why would you put a stumbling block against your brother or your sister? Accept them. You must see your fellow believer with the lens of Jesus, period. Nothing else. Jesus loves them, so must you. And as you do that, may God fill you with hope and joy and peace as you trust him so that you may overflow with that hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Did you catch that? When it was read, or when I've said it, by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is only by the power of the Holy Spirit that all this can be enabled. Without reliance of the Holy Spirit, we can not achieve it. It is the Holy Spirit alone who would renew hope, fill you with joy as you unite, you unite with another believer. Grant priests and trust to trust him. Why? Because they are brethren who can be quite a challenge. Is that not so? If you have come up in life for as long as I have, you will discover that. There are people who really are a lord to walk along with. And maybe you don't know, that could be me. You say, you le Claudius, ah, watch out, ni mungu. And this is where peace comes through though. You knowing that God is at work in them. You can trust him. You can have hope that he will perfect his work in another believer. It is not you and I to change them. It is to entrust them to the Lord as we walk along with them. And so we have that perfect unity and harmony one with another. So in verse 8 and 12, it reveals to us the schism Paul was addressing or overcoming to encourage the Jews and the Gentiles to perfect unity. And this may be the thrust of the letter of Romans which is the gospel and its effect to Jew-Gentile relationships as believers. In his final push to Christian unity, Paul uses the entire Hebrew scripture, the canon of scripture for the Hebrews, to make his point. <clears throat> Excuse me. What do I mean by that? For those who love detail, it simply means that Paul is showing from the whole Hebrew scriptures of that time, the Tanakh, if you will, the Hebrew Bible, which comprised of the law, the writings, and the prophets, or the Torah, the Ketuvim, and the Nevim, the whole scriptures, to show how these people were united in those scriptures. The Jews should not look down, nor away from the Gentile. 
and the Gentiles should not frown nor reject the Jew because both parties were united together through faith in our Lord Jesus. So Paul is deliberate and purposeful to pick scripture from those portions of the Hebrew canon of scripture, which today we call the law, the writings, and the prophets. That was the sacred writings of the Hebrew people. So verse 8 to 9, Paul writes how Christ became the servant of the Jews to bring to pass the promises God made to the patriarchs so that Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. Meaning, Jesus brought to pass the promises God made to the patriarchs, which included the Gentiles. So to the Jew, they were to directly recognize that God had the Gentiles in mind, and for the Gentiles to see that, God used the Jews as the channel to reach the world. Yes, salvation to the Jew first, but then also to the Gentiles. As it were, they were the first fruits, but then also the rest of the peoples through faith and trust in God. Just us, Christ is his resur resur resurrection, is the first fruit to all of us, them who sleep or even those who are alive. So whom would they have remembered when they heard of the patriarchs? Well, simple. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Samuel, and David. And you can tuck in also Job. Through them, the message of God came. And Jesus brought to pass all those promises. The promise that was given to Abraham when God declared to him that through your seed the nations of the world shall be blessed. And this passed on to take shape in the Messiah who came through David's line, the root of J.C. So Paul says the law saw Gentiles rejoicing with the Lord's people. They were included among the Jews. That we see from verse 10. Then the writings or some Psalms saw the Gentiles praising God in their own right. That would speak something to the Jew. The Gentiles praising God? You mean God has had envisioned them to come to his knowledge? Enlightened and called to the knowledge and love of God. Then verse 12, the prophets writing spoke of the root of Jesse, who is Jesus, ruling over the nations and the Gentiles together, placing their hope in him. Paul is revealing from scripture that believers are one through Christ and that they ought to be united. Are you, are you seeing what it would have done between the Jews and the Gentiles of his day? Just as the Jews hoped in the Messiah, Scripture saw the same for the Gentile. The two need to embrace each other to the glory of God. How would this be possible? Only by the power of the Holy Spirit given from God to strengthen and sustain believers. By the way, did you know that it is the Holy Spirit who sanctifies believers to be transformed in the likeness of Jesus? Yes, he does what the church calls sanctification, where he progressively works in you and me through us to make us represent Jesus, to make Jesus real to us and personal so that we may freely love and obey him on a daily basis. What an amazing God. First, he gives us the free gift of acceptance when we place our faith and trust in him. Then he transforms us into the likeness of his son day by day until that perfect day when we shall, he shall have us shine 
like the sun. Is this the God you know and serve? <clears throat> A loving and kind creator. You belong to him naturally, in case you didn't know. Because he made you. And guess what? He has a great plan for your life. And I say this deliberately because I know many people are hurting and losing hope currently. But if we place our faith and trust in this God who changes not, and who has the best interest of us in his heart, he can change our circumstances for the better. Crack and dope won't do it. You will just simply overdose yourself. Strong drink and drugs won't work it out. Power, wealth, and fame shall soon pass away. Let not that be your pursuit. Only God can bring you lasting peace and joy in your heart. And as men recognize Mental Health Awareness Month, why not trust Jesus with your disturbing baggage and load? He's a master offloader. He's a masterpiece provider. You will do well to join those who trust and praise him. So to this end, we were called to be united as the body of Christ through faith and trust in him, showing perfect unity among each other, not conformity and uniformity necessarily, but unity in diversity that glorifies God through the various gifts he has blessed his people with, which through the power of the Holy Spirit are expressed. I have our final lesson here. Believers can rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to foster unity one with another. Believers can rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to foster unity one with another. And no doubt, if we try to pursue our Christian faith by our own strength, we shall be miserable failures. But if we turn our eyes and focus on our counselor, the spirit of truth, he shall lead us into all truth pertaining our Christian unity. So how is God securing your unity with other fellow believers? For those of you catching us online, thank you. But it is important you identify with a body of believers whereby you might mutually grow together. Because God matures us in community with others as he glorifies his name. Now, I didn't say it's wrong to catch us online. But it cannot remain a permanent endeavor for you. Fellowship with other believers. Be united with them. And you'll experience the blessings and graces that God imparts in any group that meets together for his glory. So which brother or sister will you demolish the barrier of hostility against today? Which brother or sister? Please bow your head and consider that brother or sister you need to be united to for the glory of God. And as you contemplate that, put in heart that God desires believers to be united and reveal his love to the world. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word unto us. I have shared this in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Be blessed.